And praise the Lord. If you take your Bibles and go with us to Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to read from the Synoptic Gospels uh, uh, just a few scriptures. I want to, uh, last Sunday afternoon I spent some time talking about evangelism. Some of the folks that were uh, at our, our conference were not here. And uh, we might, I'd like to give some opportunity for some folks to share maybe this afternoon. But I'd like to, I want to just share a few simple things with you. And, where I believe we are and some things I'm looking at. I want to keep this before you. I don't want to lose momentum. I don't want to uh, waste the grace that has come unto us. God's given grace to this church. How many believe that? I don't want that grace to be brought to us in vain. I want to do something with it. But a familiar scripture, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Now, There are folks that believe these passages don't apply to us, but I don't think they're in this room. So we'll not worry about them, all right? Matthew 28 and verse 19. Go ye therefore into and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now that being with us is not just His omniscience, uh, or His omnipresence rather. It's not His omnipresence, but refers to Him being with us as He did in Mark 16. Mark 16, if you will. We'll compare that, verse 15, to this passage, and that's the sense in which... He was with them, or promised to be with them. Mark 16 and verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now you know there are a lot of folks that struggle with that passage. I'm just going to give you a little insight. Not going to spend time. This is not where I want to go this afternoon. But I just want to tell you not to worry. A lot of folks read that and think, oh, then you're not saved or you're not born again until you're baptized. Let's note what it does not say. It does not say, he that believeth and is baptized shall be born again. It does not say, he that believeth and is baptized shall be regenerated. It says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And the word salvation here is used in the sense of its eternal work that the Lord puts in our life. Salvation is a process. Salvation is something that progresses in our life. The Bible says in Thessalonians, He has chosen us to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and obedience of the truth. And that's the sense here. And it's the idea. It's not that uh, belief in baptism produces regeneration. No, it is that a man that believes and a man that is willing to submit to the commands of Christ, the first of those being water baptism, that's a man the Lord's going to save. That's a man that God has saved and will save. He shall be saved. This is a thing that God will be able to save him and deliver that man because he can't deliver deliver a man who doesn't trust Him and doesn't obey Him. And that's the concept in that verse. Trust and obey and show me any man that God that will trust Jesus and obey Jesus and Jesus will save him. Through every trial, from every enemy, through every difficulty, through every affliction, he will be saved. And notice, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And again, my point, that water baptism was not something essential here to the new birth or essential to regeneration. He did not say on the flip side, and he would have needed to say, On the flip side, if water baptism had been essential, he would have needed to say, but he that believeth and is baptized not shall be damned. That's not what he said. He said, he that believeth not shall be damned. So the idea is that a man comes, he puts faith in Christ, that faith issues out in obedience and the Lord saves him. But others, if they're not even willing to put faith in Christ, they can't even get their foot in the door. They are, they are forever destroyed or will be led to destruction. So don't get all uptight that when some, some churches want to tell you that water baptism is essential to salvation. Let us not degrade it. It's needful. It's necessary. It's biblical. 
It needs to be done as a testimony, but not as something that is essential to our conversion. And notice what he said. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Glory to God. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. Now put this passage. Remember Matthew where he said, And I will be with you always to the end of the age or the end of the world. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord, what? Working, Working with them and confirming the word which signs followed. That's how he meant he'd be with them. He would work with them and he would confirm the word with signs following. He wasn't talking about simply this sense, well, I know the Lord was there in my trial. That's not the sense he's, I know that is true about it. True about our Lord. But that's not what he's talking about in Matthew 28 when he says, And lo, I'm with you always. He was telling them. I'm telling them because when he was with them, he did signs. He did wonders. He, he ministered among them. And he's telling us, I'm not going to stop that. I'm just going to do it through the Spirit. I'm going to keep working with you. You're still going to see signs. You're still going to see wonders. My presence is still going to be manifested in you and among you. And the Word will be confirmed. And that's what I pray God does. Confirm His Word again and again. But it will come when we believe. Therefore, let us believe. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and verse 45. And then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. He talked about referring back to what the Scriptures were, the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. He mentioned that Back in verse 44. But the Lord opens up their understanding. I will tell you that the New Testament sheds a light on the old. That you can't get without it. It's just simple that way. That's why a Jew who hangs on to the Old Testament is still in darkness. He is in darkness. Because he has not seen the light of Jesus Christ. And then he said, And said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer, And to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. That's the gospel. That's the command. That's the Great Commission. It's found in Acts chapter 1 as well. I'm not going to go there. But I want to share with you a few things here this afternoon. I want to talk about again this church and pray. And I want to challenge you to some things here. And I want to just mention a few things, first of all, uh, about the gospel. He told us to go out and mark and Matthew. He said, preach the gospel. Mark, he said, preach the gospel. In verse 47 of Luke 24, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name. Preach the gospel. The gospel is that word in Greek which is the idea of heralding something, evangelizing or gospelizing. There's a, a, the passage that talks about using that word evangelizing is the idea of gospelizing. But it's the idea idea of simple gospel means good news. That's what it means. And I know we, we've lost maybe the feeling of that and the sense of that, but that word literally means good news. You and I have a message of good news to this world. We really do. You would think that anybody would want to hear good news. But good news is what we've got. And we have got a story to tell. We have got a message to preach. We've got something to share with people. And I wanted to just do something I've not done before. I want to, I want to mention some things about the gospel again. The word gospel. Uh, is, is the idea of good news. It is the idea of heralding and telling this business of good news. But this good news is specific. 
And I want to take, uh, I took the phrase gospel of and, and just took my search engine and, and, uh, and e-sword and, and, and looked that phrase up and found at least ten groupings, the way I'm going to group them, of what uh, is placed or how that gospel is identified in the Scriptures. We're not just preaching any news. We're not just preaching any gospel. We're not telling the good news of America. We're not telling the good news of WPC. We're not telling the good news of somebody's baby that was born. We're telling the good news of the gospel, Jesus Christ. Now, and so I want to just... Uh, a little exercise in Scripture here. First of all, more frequently, the most frequent phrase found in Scripture is the phrase Gospel of Christ. Eleven times in the New Testament is found the Gospel of Christ. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. He talked about in Romans 15, I've fully preached the Gospel of Christ. Again, in verse 29, he said, I come to in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, it's mentioned two times. I preach the gospel of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, he talks about the gospel of Christ and the glorious gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, again the gospel of Christ. Chapter 10, the gospel of Christ. Galatians, Philippians, and 1 Thessalonians, it is the gospel of Christ. That is, first of all, this is the gospel of a person. This is the good news, not of a religion, not of a religious system, not of a moral system. It's not the good news of the story that we're telling. It's not about an event that merely happens. Sometimes we talk about, I just come to talk about the crucifixion. You divorce the crucifixion from the per- person of Jesus Christ. Christ and you're not preaching the gospel. The crucifixion is preached in conjunction with the person. Separate Christ from Christianity and you don't have Christianity. Christianity is Christ. That's what it's all about. It is the gospel of a person. Christ who was sent. Christ emphasizes his work of being sent. He is Messiah. He was sent by God. He was sent by the Father. He was promised to us. He is the Redeemer that has come. He was promised to Eve. He was promised to Moses. He was promised to Isaiah. He was promised to Jeremiah. He was promised in Malachi. He was promised in all of the prophets. Uh, Daniel talks about Him coming. You can read it through the law, through the prophets, in the Psalms, there is one promise that would come. Son of David, seed of David, seed of Abraham, and He has come unto you and come unto I. It's a person by whom we are saved, in whom we are saved, and how we are saved is by a person. And that's something that's very, very important. It is the gospel of Christ. And Christ, again, emphasizing, emphasizing His being sent, His purposefully coming. His coming wasn't accidental. His coming wasn't by chance. It wasn't a second thought. It was the plan of God. It was the promise of God. It was the power of God. How many times was that gospel, did it try to stop, did the devil try to hinder the promise from coming? We have it was called, the promise was given first of all to uh, Eve, uh, the seed of the woman. I'm telling you, the devil's corrupted the earth so bad that we get down and we've got one family upon the earth. If humanity dies, the Redeemer cannot come. He will come through the seed of the woman. He has to be born in this earth. God must have somebody who will live on this earth in faith in Him and perpetuate that seed. And so God will save the earth and one man Noah will be on it and from the loins of Noah, Messiah will come. There will be a promise to Abraham. How many times would the enemy would like to have wiped out the Jewish people? Oh, Haman would have had them destroyed in Babylon. He would have had them all destroyed. But I'm here to tell you, God sent a a woman, a maiden girl, if you will, uh, uh, the king's wife to the kingdom for such a time as this. And God spared the nation of Israel time and time again. He will be born. And every promise, every condition that God added to the Messiah made it that much more opportunity, if you will, for the devil to shut down the plan. He didn't have to stop all promises. He didn't have to shut down every aspect
expect of the Messiah. He only has to stop one. He only has to get one to keep from being fulfilled. One prophecy unfulfilled and God's a liar. One prophecy unfulfilled and God is not sovereign. But I'm telling you, He was born seed of the woman and seed of Abraham. God said, seed of David. We came down and the seed of David had got wiped out. An old ugly woman by the name of Athaliah, the daughter of Jezebel, was ruling on the throne. And one seed, one son, Josiah, had been saved out of all the rest and was hidden away in the temple. Oh, but I'm telling you, God didn't need but one. Glory to the Lamb of God. He didn't have to have a whole host of them. If he's got one seed, he could preserve that seed. And I'll tell you, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Abraham, the city of David, the seed of David, the promise came again and again and again. The prophecies were fulfilled. And so understand that what's wrapped up in this salvation is not just a little old message that happened a couple thousand years ago. It's something that began in a promise to Eve back in the garden of Eden. Actually, before that, it began in the plan of God. When God, before God even formed this earth, the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. So that gospel message, that good news we have, is the message of Christ. And it involves... All of God's dealings with man and bringing His man to redeem us. Second phrase we found most, most frequently used is the gospel of God. Eight times in the New Testament this phrase is found. Paul said in Romans 1 and 1, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. In Romans 15, he called it, he was ministering the gospel of God. In 2 Corinthians 11, he said, I preach to you the gospel of God. He talked about it uh, again, preaching in Philippi, or Philippi, the gospel of God. Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 2 and verse 8. He mentions the gospel of God. And for three times actually in that chapter. 1 Timothy 1, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. 1 Peter 4 and 7, judgment begins at the house of God. How should, if it first begin in us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? The second aspect of this gospel is that yes, it's the gospel of a person named Jesus. Yes, it's a gospel of a man named Christ Jesus who come to us. But even more than that, it is the gospel of God Almighty. This is the good news of not just a man who was sent, but God Himself who came and walked among us. It is the gospel of God. We're telling the story, not of a mere historical figure, not of just a human being that lived upon the earth, not just another military leader, not just another religious founder. No, we're telling the story of God Himself, Emmanuel, who walked upon this earth and has come down among us, God with us. So that our gospel is not man or Originated. It's not man designed. It is man told in the sense that God uses man as a vessel. But this is God's gospel. This is God's message unto man. This is God's word to mankind. It is the gospel of God. The third thing is found four times in the, in the New Testament. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. These are all located, though three in Matthew, one in Mark. But it talks about that Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Whenever we're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, it's the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness, and then the end shall come. And John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the gospel of the kingdom is this idea that is preached of the gospel. It's not just the gospel of the one sent to us, Christ. It's not just the message of God dwelling among man. It's the message of His kingdom. It's the message of God's rule. It's not just this God who comes down to forgive. It's not just this God that comes down so that you don't have to go to hell. It's this God that comes down to reconcile you to Himself, to redeem you from your iniquity, so that you can get back to living under His government and under His rule in His kingdom. It is the gospel of the kingdom. Now that's important for us to remember. What are we doing? I, I, why I, the reason I'm sharing this with you is that when you're telling people about Jesus, you are out there and preaching the gospel, you've got to preach Christ. Yes. You've got to tell folks about this one that's been sent to us. And you've got to tell them He's God. This is God's plan. This is God's message. It's God's morality. It's God's book. It's God's Word. Yes. 
But you've got to tell them too that the essence of this gospel is to bring you under God's rule. So that you quit governing your own life and allow God to govern. The idea here is that God's kingdom reigns supreme. There's a kingdom of darkness. You're in the kingdom of darkness. But God come to deliver you from the kingdom of darkness and bring you into the kingdom of His dear Son. Hallelujah. To translate you from the kingdom of darkness and put you into the kingdom of His dear Son. I'm telling you, there is a warfare going on. There is a battle out there. There is a real power. There are real powers and principalities that are ruling and governing in people's lives. And when we preach the gospel, there's a power that's got to go with it that can break the chains, that can break the bondages, that can break the dominion of sin and the dominion of Satan, that can liberate people. The gospel is of no value if it can't break the power of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of light. I'm telling you, we got to get that in our spirits again. Because our world's getting more wicked. And when we preach, we're preaching to demon-possessed people. We're preaching to them bound in cigarettes. They're bound in drugs. They're bound in alcohol. They're bound in prostitution. They're bound in anger. They're bound in the bitterness. They're bound in the religions. They're just bound. And we've got to see them delivered. And you've got to know the message you preach is a powerful message. It's so powerful that it will liberate them where they are. That we can declare to a people with such authority. And if you will believe in Jesus Christ. I was just this week uh, sharing with a young man. Who just recently come to the church. But I was just this week sharing with him. Look, put those things away. Put away that sin. Put away that, that wrong thing. Throw it out of your... That's what you got to do. God ain't going to take it out of your house for you. God ain't going to come down and get rid of your, your, your sin red and pour your liquor down the drawer, down the down the sink. He ain't gonna do that. He ain't gonna tear up your porn magazines and put them in the stove where they belong. He's not gonna do that for you. You do that. You get the junk out of your house. You throw it out of your life, and then you look up to God and say, "Lord, I reckon that I'm dead to sin and alive to you, and I want to experience the liberating power and the freedom from the bondage of sin and the body of death. I want to be delivered from it, and I want every addiction taken away. And I'm asking you to do this so I can serve you." I said, you believe that? God will do it. God will do that for you. He'll liberate you. This is the gospel of the kingdom that we're preaching. Fourth, is it's called the gospel of the Son. In Mark 1 and 1, two times it's mentioned, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Romans 1 and 9, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son. That's something unique about this gospel. God sent His Son. This gospel, whether we like it or not, it is not adequately preached unless it preaches a triune God. You cannot be saved from your sins unless God exists in more than one person. We cannot have Calvary. We cannot have someone who can reach to the hand of God and the hand of man unless we've got more than one person in the Godhead. It is essential. This is the good news of His Son. Oh, hallelujah. Allah never sent a son. No, sir. There is none other that sent a son. Oh, some folks talk about, oh, that's wicked. What kind of man would send his son to die? What kind of God would send his son to die? A God that loves you. Right. I remember the parable. Years ago I read it. That was called the parable of the drawbridge. You've heard me tell the story. But there was this father, he had this only son that he loved, raised, adored him, loved him deeply. His son would come to work with him. And the father's job was that all he did all day long was he sat in this little hut. And when the ships would come by and needed to get under the bridge, he would pull the levers. And all the machinery was there. And it would raise that drawbridge so the ship could pass underneath of it. And his son loved his daddy. And he would come and he would play and he would spend time with his daddy on his job. And his father loved it. But one day the son was there. And one day the son was playing. And he had been playing a little too close to the mechanisms and the machinery. And he fell. And he fell amongst the gears turning. And about that time, the horn of the ship sounded. The drawbridge must be raised. And the father is reaching to pull the lever to raise the drawbridge. But he knows if he does, the gears will turn and his son will be crushed to death. 
But if he doesn't raise the drawbridge, the ship will crash and many people on the ship will die. And so the father has to make a terrible choice. And he pulls the lever and his son loses his life. The people pass by under the drawbridge, not knowing the sacrifice that has been made. But what's your point, Brother Wood? It took take a love of that father for mankind and for humanity. It took a greater love. He would have been more willing to give himself than he would to give his son. It would have been easier had he came and given himself of that man at that drawbridge. It was a much greater sacrifice. What's your point? The point is this. It takes a greater love to give Give your son when you really love, when you're really true, when you're really sacrificial at heart. It takes a greater love to give your son than it does to give yourself. Any loving parent would give themselves before their son. So wouldn't God. But in this case, the only way you could be saved is by the death of the son. He must come. Why? Because we're children of God. We're sons of God. That's who we are. And we can't, we want to be reconciled. We're going to continue to be sons. And the elder son had to come and rescue those that were under him. Number five, it's called the gospel of peace. Two times in scripture. Romans 10 and Ephesians 6. The Bible talks about our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, why is it called the gospel of peace? It's not called the gospel of peace because everybody receives it peaceably. It's not called the gospel of peace because when you preach it, everybody calms down. No matter of fact, sometimes you'll preach it and stir things up. So it's not called the gospel of peace for those reasons. It's called the gospel of peace because it is the message that can reconcile men to God and make men have peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's called a gospel of peace. That's what our feet need to be shod and ready to do. There's a readiness and a preparedness that everywhere we are, men are at enmity with God. Men are at war with God. Sinners are at war with God. God. They're scattering. They're destroying the kingdom. They're preaching a sinful life, a selfish lifestyle. But we are here that men can have peace with God. So realize that when you're preaching the gospel, sometimes we don't like it, but you have got to learn to see that that sinner man is at war with God. And you are here so that he doesn't have to fight against God anymore. He can be reconciled. You've got the message that can bring peace between that person and God. That's a wonderful thing. That makes us ambassadors. That makes us, that's what an ambassador does. He goes out to represent and make peace between dividing factions or warring factions. And that's what we are to do. Number six, only one time mentioned, but it's called the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20 and 24, he talks about, I've received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. This message is a message of God's favor in the midst of condemnation, in the midst of uh, of under the judgment of God. This is a message of hope. This is a message where God was to change your life and give you strength to do what is right. We just made it. I'm telling you, nowhere do you find it's just a gospel of forgiveness. Nowhere do you find it's a gospel of getting folks to heaven. It's a gospel of God's grace. It's a gospel that comes preaching a message to someone, showing them how to live in the here and now. The grace of God that bringing salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. It's the good news of God's grace so you can live now. I know it's not... In some sense, is the uh, how can I call it? the self-help preachers of today, the Osteen who talks about your best life now. Let me tell you, this isn't my best life now, and it isn't going to ever be my best life now. And if this is the best we got. If we are, have hope in this world only, we are of all men most miserable. No, my best life is coming. <laughs> Woo! 
glory. When I get a glorified body. And when I'm going to forever be. That's when my best life's coming. It isn't my best life now. But it is a righteous life now. It is a sober life now. It is a godly life now. And that's all possible by the grace of God. It'd be nice if you could live your Christian life in an ideal world. In a world where there are no selfishness. Basically like heaven. But we don't live our Christian life in heaven. We live it here on this earth. And so our message to people is this. You can live it here and now. Number seven. It's the gospel of circumcision and uncircumcision. Galatians 2 and 7. He talks about the gospel of uncircumcision committed unto Paul. And uh, the gospel of circumcision committed unto Peter. There is no prejudice in this gospel. Uncircum and circum uncircumcision and circumcision includes everybody in the world. You are either a Jew or a Gentile. That's it. You fall, everyone in this room falls into that last category. We're all Gentiles. That's who we are. And the gospel of uncircumcision came unto us. But the idea, it's not a gospel that preaches uncircumcision or circumcision. It's not a gospel that focuses on making a mark in your body. But it's a gospel that comes to everybody. Whether you were outside the covenant of God uh, or whether you were a part of the covenant of God in Israel. In other words, it's the same gospel to the Jew and the same gospel to the Gentile. It's the same gospel. We don't have a different gospel for the Arabs or a different gospel for the Mexicans or a different gospel for the Americans. It's the same message everywhere we go. It's the same gospel for every man and every woman. Number nine. Ephesians. Huh? Eight. Sorry. Thank you, my brother. I need to correct my outline. I skipped the number eight. Thank you. The number eight. Someone is listening. Oh, that is that is fruit. Oh, that nothing thrills a preacher more than that. <laughs> Ephesians one and three. He says, "In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the gospel of." Your salvation. It's called the gospel of your salvation. I'm going to tell you right now, this news changes your life. It is the gospel that liberates you. It's the gospel that delivers you. The message we have is a message of salvation. It's a message of deliverance. It's a message that takes a man and brings him out of his darkness and brings him into light. And it doesn't just stop at conversion. I'm telling you, or, or, or happen at conversion. It's all my life. I need the gospel today. I preached the gospel in this church this morning. I'm going to preach the gospel every Sunday. I pray by the grace of God. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Sunday afternoon, every Thursday. I want every message I preach to be the gospel because this message saves you. And you need saved every day. You need saved every day. I need to know how I can be saved from emotions overwhelming me. I need to know how I can be saved from being a bad father. I need to know how I can be saved from being a bad, a bad husband. I need to know how I can be saved from being influenced by the world. I need to know how I can be saved from being unfaithful. I, I, I need saved. I need deliverance. And this gospel message brings that message of hope and deliverance. And I said there were ten, but because I miscounted, there are only nine. And this is number nine. And it's called the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I could have lumped that with the gospel of Christ, but I, I, I chose to separate it out because I think the emphasis is upon this. It's the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is a gospel of the Christ, but it's a gospel that says you must accept Christ in every one of His offices. He is Lord and the Sovereign over your life. He is Jesus, the man that has come to save and live among us. He is Christ, the one that is sent from God in His Messiahship. So that in every aspect of our life, He is the one. He becomes everything to us. You are complete in Him. It's the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not as Brother Messer had shared it. Some folks preach and they, they preach that when you get saved you become a Christian and then later on you become a disciple when you get saved you receive Him as Savior and then later on in your Christian experience you receive Him as Lord, that's untrue we want to let folks know it's a package deal when you accept 
Him. He's Lord. He's Jesus. He's Christ. He's the one sent to you. He's the one that came and lived among us to save you. And He is the one that will rule you and govern you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Oh, hallelujah. So this message of the gospel is a message that first of all talks about the Christ. He's the central figure of it. The one that's been sent unto us. It's the gospel of God. It's the God man that has walked among us. God's plan, not ordained or invented by man. It's the gospel of kingdom that brings men under the rule of God. It's the gospel of the Son that talks about the triune God and enables men to be saved because God sent His Son. It's the gospel of peace that reconciles men to God. It's the gospel of grace that gives men strength to live the life in the here and now. It's the gospel of circumcision and uncircumcision that, that uh, shows discrimination to none, but is for everyone and has the same effect on everyone. This gospel will produce the same salvation in you that it did in me. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is the same in you as in me. He may have special things He'll do in your life. He may take you to another area of the world then He takes me, but His same Holy Ghost uh, will witness to the same Word, will preach the same morality, will bring the same truth, uh, and will lead you to the same Christ and to the same place. It's the gospel of your salvation. So it's a gospel that liberates and delivers. And it's the gospel that preaches the whole personhood of Jesus Christ till we accept Him in all of His offices, in all that He is. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a powerful message. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. No wonder he said that. Because wherever man that went, man went and preached it, it changed lives. I'm going to tell you something. We've allowed our world to make us think that God can't do it anymore. It's gotten so wicked that we think that God can't do it. I'm telling you, He can do it. He can do it. He can still say, oh, they don't want it. I don't know about who wants it and don't want it. I'm not to preach it to those who want it. I'm to preach it. They want it, they'll come. They don't want it, they won't. But I want them to know they're turning down the greatest thing. And I want them to know that even though they may not believe it, I do. And they may not let it change them, but it changed me. Do you understand that's the greatest power that we have? Is to go out and tell folks, it made a change in me. It made a change. You know, you got to have that. Some of you young folks, I know where you're at. And I'm not putting this down because it's where I'm at. It's where I've been. But it's what we do want. We want both. We want folks to be saved out of that. But we want folks to get saved and raise their families in it. And not go out there in that mess. Amen. And sometimes young people, you may feel like you've been raised in church. You're like, well, I've never been out there and I go out there and how am I going to witness to drunk? I don't know what it is to drink. I never tasted alcohol. Praise God. Amen. Well, I don't know what it is, you know, to, to, to be in porn. I never looked at porn. I don't know what it is to be addicted to cigarettes. How am I going to witness to these folks? Look, your message is not about you. It's about Jesus. And I'm telling you, you can still tell them what He's done in you as well. Because after you serve the Lord, I'm telling you, yes, I've never had those things. I've never tasted liquor. I've never smoked. I've never drank. I've never had drugs. I've never had any of that junk. And I love it more now than I ever did 38 years later. But i got something to tell people that I've been through fire and Jesus keeps you. I've been in the death throes and Jesus keeps you. I've been in need of healing and Jesus heals you. I'm telling you, I've seen Him wash me. I've seen Him make me. I've seen Him break me. I've seen Him do things in my life. And I've seen Him deliver me and change me and He'll do it for you. My bondage may not be your bondage, but sin is sin. No matter where it's at. Alright, here's where I want to go. I'm going to close. What do you got to do, Brother Woods? I want you to listen to this message. I want you to, first of all, I want you to get in love with the Gospel again. I want you to see what powerful message we preach. Believe it. Live it. We want to continue our praying, church. Number one. Number two. You've got to pray for God to give you His heart for the lost. You will never reach souls if you don't have a heart for them. You don't want to go out and do it. It's just something that's mechanical. We don't want to do it as something that's just automatic. It's regimented. I'm just doing my duty. If you're doing your duty, nobody's going to believe you. Nobody's going to accept you. You've got to get in here. 
That means you're going to have to see sinners as God sees them. If I go out there with hatred and venom towards them, I'm not going to win them. If I go out there just to make folks mad, I'm not going to win them. I've got to go out there and see them. This tattooed, body pierced, freakish looking person is a shepherd or a sheep without a shepherd. He's lost. He's of no value to God because he's lost. He's a sinner. He's the enemy of God. But I got a message that can turn that person around. I got a message that can take that person. Look, I'm going to tell you something. I'm telling you, I have never seen a light that folks are, are, are tattooing themselves up. Hideous. Hideous. We're becoming beast. We're wearing brands like cattle. I'm telling you. It's hideous what's taking place. We're, we're, we're becoming... It's just defacing this precious creation of God to make it something horrid looking. And I'm going to tell you something. It may not happen in all cases, but I believe God can save folks and He can perform a miracle and take that mess off of them too. You don't think God can't do that? I believe He could. If it's something that would hinder, if it's something that would distract the gospel, I've known some preachers that after that they are they, they got saved, had tat, tattoos, and they didn't want to be distracted. But they were able to just on their arms, they wore long sleeves the rest of their days and kept them covered up and, and folks weren't distracted by them. There may be some things and situations you could do, but folks put them these days, I'm telling you, ain't no way you'd cover them up. Unless you just become like the, the Muslims and just wear a veil and everything. I mean, just let your eyeballs shine out and that's about it. And, and cover everything else. Well, But I'm going to tell you something right now. That God's able to deliver. And if need be, He can erase that mess off of you if it need be it may be that sometimes the marks of sin are there and your glorified body won't have them praise the Lord that's okay but I, I just want you to tell you that that's the power of the gospel and we've got to get God's heart for the lost pray as you pray God let me see the lost as you see practice it when you're going down the street you see that person you're tempted to just go up and punch them in the nose because they're rude because they're crude because they're living such an abhorrent life but you need to find a way to say not to excuse them not to overlook their junk, not to overlook their mess, but to have enough love to go up and say, Sir, you can be the same from where you're at. That takes discernment. It takes power. It takes discernment. Some folks you got to go up and hit between the eyes. I don't mean literally, but you got to wake them up. Man, you, you, sir, do you know how ugly you look? I, I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just telling you the time may come to do it. There may be certain people that you have to deal with that way. But there will be others. You will not be able to do that with them. You need to understand something in preaching of the gospel. There are no two people alike in this world. And all the message, there is a general sense to the message. There's a specific sense to the message. Jesus, when He preached the gospel, never dealt with any two people in the same way. He always did it differently. Because He reached out to where they were. Open your hearts. Okay, you're going to pray. Pray for God. Pray to God's heart for sinners. Pray to see sinners as God sees them. This here. Open your heart and open your home. If you don't get a heart bigger than your own little world, a heart that's willing to step out and get involved in somebody's life, you'll never reach anybody for Jesus. You can't preach the gospel at a distance. You can't preach the gospel from a hands-off perspective. You gotta get involved. You gotta talk. I'm gonna tell you, I've won some people to the Lord Jesus Christ, and it sure has made my life busy. Their problems become my problems. Their struggles become my struggles. When they got in hardships, I was one of the first ones there. I just got a call the other day. Brother, got this situation going on. Help me. It's my son in the faith. Help me. What do I do? Give me counsel. I'm going to tell you right now, you win somebody to Jesus, you're going to be one of the first people they look to when they're in struggles and troubles. you got to get your heart open, first of all. And when Lydia opened up her heart, she opened up her home. You're going to have to be willing to get your floors dirty. Amen. You're going to have to be willing to let someone come in and sit on your couch and talk to them. I'm not telling you to make your house a homeless shelter. I'm not telling you that. God tells you to do that, you do it. That's not what I'm talking about. And, and like I said, if God leads you down that road, you go ahead. But I'm telling you some right now. 
And it's one of the best ways we've got to reach people today because people don't do it in our culture. Hey, fella, come on in and sit down. Can I give you a cup of coffee? Would you like a cup of iced tea or a glass of iced tea? Would you like some lemonade? Get your home open. Now, you may not always, but you're going to have to do that. You know, someone's in trouble. You're preaching your ministry. They're one. Sir, how about this? How about coming and visiting with me Saturday at my house? And we'll sit down and we'll have some time to talk. Amen? Got to do that, church. I know that's harder sometimes because we're so scattered. But God can give you folks that you can win on your next door. And you say, Brother Woods, they won't come like I am. Well, you're traveling that distance. God can change their heart too. Or God can give you so many people, we'll start a church where you're at. Amen. And maybe use you to start a church. Glory to God. All right. I got, I got to finish with this. Um, I want to challenge you. Find where you can serve. And I need to know this. I may approach people God leads me to do so. But I want you to have it in your heart. Let me just talk to you about areas of our church. Number one, where we can serve. We made up some visitor cards. I have one man that came to me and said he'll be giving out visitor cards. I know, I just mentioned it last Sunday, so I'm mentioning it again. Some of you weren't here. I mentioned it again, and I will continue. If you're interested, I made up new visitor cards. If you're interested in being a person that would be responsible for handing out cards in our services to visitors, like we had this morning, make sure you give them a card, make sure you get it back and get it, get it to me so we know where to go with it. And, uh, and, and just do that. That's all. It just requires you to be here and, and to be ready to greet someone. Make sure you greet the visitor. Give them a card. I'm going to order some pins. I want to talk about I haven't talked to Brother Doug about it yet. I'll talk to him about it. I want to, it was on my heart to order some ink pens and uh, give them a card. Give them the ink pen. Tell them to keep the pen. But that pen's going to have our name on it. It's going to have our, our website address on it. It's going to have our church telephone number on it. So that they have at least some way to uh, get a hold of us. Amen. And uh, to remember us. And, and, and then we could take the car. I got two visitor cards today. Somebody, two people that want to know more about our church. Amen. I'm not going to be able to go see all these people in these cards. I need someone. I need more than one. I said, Brother Woods, I'll be willing to go represent our church. Now you need to know what we believe. You need to be a good representative of the church. But I'm willing to go represent our church and share with them about our church and share with them about Jesus Christ. I'm willing to go make that visit. Two cards. Uh, i I'm, I got to leave Wednesday. I doubt that I'm going to get, but I can make a phone call. But I'd like someone who will commit before I leave here tonight and say, I'll make a phone call. I'll make a contact to these people. Now, this is not for everybody. I'm not trying to put anybody on a guilt trip. I'm just telling you what's available and what the need is. As we get visitors, as we have cards, people want to be contacted. It may be as simple as making a phone call and sending them a copy of our faith and practice back there, our introducing WPC brochures, or, or maybe a referral. They may say, I really want to speak to a pastor of the church and I have some counseling issues, and, and that's okay. But you made a contact, you get back, and the pastors then can schedule that visit. So I know that not everybody in the church will do that, but it's something that needs to be done. Making those kind of visits. Door-to-door witnessing. Not everybody's going to go door-to-door, but I need to know. i got to get the teams. I want to start it up, but I don't want to start it up without knowing who's going to be involved in it. So I need to know. Brother Woods, I can't commit to every Saturday, but I want to go knock on some doors, and I will be there as many Saturdays as possible, and I will make an effort. I'm not just going to do it a couple times and quit. All right? I'll make an effort. I need someone who can knock on doors. Um, you know, we're, again, I'm not saying we're going to do this, but maybe the Lord puts it on your heart. Last Sunday, Brother Steve had mentioned about even just going down on the waterfront, handing out CDs, setting up a little table with our, our WPC brochures, and, and uh, put a little sign up, Western Pentecostal Church, hand out preaching CDs. You may just be inviting people to church. Uh, just folks that come just because they got invited to church, you know. They may be in a situation where they're struggling. But maybe you just feel comfortable doing that. There's nothing wrong with that. I want you to find a place where you can be involved in reaching the lost. So maybe that's something that interests you. Pray about it. Sending cards to the sick. 
uh, taking care of that. There's there's that kind of ministry that can be done. I would it would be nice. I if I had the sick in the hospital, I have to go visit them. I, I always make an effort to go visit any of our members that are in the hospital. And sometimes folks that aren't our members. I haven't visited everybody that calls me. That a lot of folks maybe outside the church or someone's great lost aunt that's somewhere four times removed. I might sometimes haven't went, but if they really want me to, I'll make an effort to go and visit them in the hospital. But It'd be nice not to have to worry about, okay, this is so-and-so. Did we take flowers? My wife is always taking care of that. Did we send something up? But it'd be nice to have somebody who would know, okay, so-and-so from our church is in the hospital. You know, we can give you the approval or whatever, so much a budget, that you'll be responsible for making sure that flowers are sent or some appropriate gift to that person in the hospital. It would take something off of me uh, and my wife who go and visit. I need folks... Who are good typists at times, not all the time. But sometimes I need folks just to do typing. You may be something you enjoy. All right. Then just let make yourself available. Make yourself available. Uh, I, I've got maybe one of my daughters that were going to take it, but I haven't got her commitment yet. But uh, I need someone who can maintain our website. I need someone who is computer savvy and can work on keeping our website up to date. I need, uh, we have folks that minister in a nursing home, but we really need a full-time man who can go with these ladies and minister twice a month. Twice a month, ladies. Twice a month. Thank God for our young women. Al is when at times, and maybe he will more when he gets freed up. Maybe that God lays on his heart, but that's up to him. But I, I did that for years when I first started. But I just had so many things going. I, I went elsewhere. Uh, but I can tell you that it can be a very fruitful ministry. It can be a very fruitful ministry just to go and witness to those people and share the gospel. Share the gospel. And there's a lot of folks in there that used to be in church. I'll tell you, there's some folks in there, their kids don't visit them. They're stuck in there. They'd like to hear a good Holy Ghost anointed message. It encourages them. And, and that is, that's a help. Because I'm telling you, a lot of folks sop their parents away and never visit them. And, and there's folks in there that's actually been in holiness churches. And they love to hear a fire, Holy Ghost filled message. So, thank God for our young ladies who have been faithful to that. Church cleaning. Don't take this the wrong way. All right. And sure enough, someone will. I hope not. I want off the cleaning list. My family is involved in a lot. I don't need to be here cleaning the church. I'm not saying that because of me, but there's a lot of other folks that can do. You know what? I'd really like to see it. I know we all share it. But I'm going to be honest with you. There's some folks who do it better than others. I'd really like to see three or four teams that say, I love to clean house. I like to vacuum. I like to see things neat. That they would take that as their ministry. And other folks who just do it because they're on the list, we can take them off the list. Yes, Amen. I appreciate the work that's been done. I appreciate the folks faithful. Sister Linda's been faithful to, to do this and, and, and the Leggett family to take it. But uh, it, I'd like to see three or four families that would say, hey, you know what? I love to clean and I can do good. And I'll make sure when our folks come in there on Sunday mornings, they're going to find a clean sanctuary. They're going to find clean bathrooms. They're going to find a clean Sunday school classroom. And I'd delight to do that. And if, if that was something you can make as your ministry, it's more of a blessing when someone does it who delights to do it than someone does it because I want to do it. I can tell you I don't delight in it, but I will do it. And I've vacuumed a powerful lot around here. But I can tell you that my family's involved in a lot of things already. And I'd like to see the pastors off the cleaning list because we got a lot of folks, other folks in this church, that aren't even on it and can take care of it. That's not to blame. That's to open it up. A lot of you folks aren't even aware of that. You probably didn't even know that, that Brother Wood's family. A couple times a year, we clean this church. Faithful. I don't mind doing that, church. Matter of fact, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm here during the week, and sometimes it's got to be tidied up Wednesday. I'll do a little tidy up work. I mean, you didn't notice it, but uh, if you'd have come to church Wednesday and you were here and I hadn't have done something, you'd have seen a trail of mud going up our steps back there. But I vacuumed it up. It happens Sunday afternoon or something. No big deal. I'm glad it gets dirty. It means we got people around here. They just don't like folks to get things to get out of place. Oh, look what that little kid did. That chair is not in place. What do you want? A chair in place or children in your church? I'll take children in my church. Amen. I can put the chair back in its place or teach the kid to put it back in its place. Amen. Church maintenance. I, I just handed one out to Brother Gordon. He's been our pressure washer. Ladies, did y'all get that paper towel rack fixed in your kitchen? Well, don't worry about it. Gordon's taken care of. 
I saw it. I forget, you know, get time to go put up a paper towel rack. But you know what? It's good to have someone who would notice that. Take that upon their heart. Brother Woods, I'll just walk around here Sunday. I'll make sure. And let the women, if they have a problem with their toilets in their bathroom, have them come to me. Whoa! That'd be happy. Happy day. That would make me. You say, that doesn't matter. That's not working for God. Come off of it. We need this place. We need this place of worship. We use this place. It is important. And I can tell you, it makes a bad name on you when folks come and stuff looks slipshod and out of place and junky and falling off. And if we have someone that takes it on their heart. I remember a man who told Brother Messer one time, I told him before, but Brother Messer, I can't preach. He said, you can preach. He said, I'd love just to be your servant. I'd mow your grass. I'd take care of your home. I'd maintain your home. And you could concentrate on preaching. I know much to Brother Messer's disappointment, that didn't happen. It was in Scotland, and that guy didn't come back over with him. But I know, praise the Lord. But you think that's bad. No, it's not. It's biblical. And that person that is faithful and took it on their heart, and they were excellent at maintaining it, could see just as much reward as a man who preached and saw thousands, one to Jesus Christ. God doesn't measure things like we do, folks. All right? We got ladies working at the pregnancy center. You may want to be involved there. Eagles Wings. We give money to them, but I'd like to see us have some volunteers there. Man, they need boxes loaded. They need people that can go in there. You might just be able to find time to go down to Eagles Wings and volunteer. That's a place you can represent our church. Amen? Prayer. Brother Woods, I can't knock on doors, but I promise when folks knock on doors, I'll be on my knees seeking God for them. That's probably one of the greatest ministries we need in the whole church is people that say, I'll pray. And mean it. I don't mean I'll pray and give us five minutes a day. Amen. I'll pray. Praise the Lord. Okay. What's your point? I've named you several things. Surely you can find something in there somewhere. A place to serve. But I don't want you to just do it. I want you to pray about it. I want you to think about it. I could use some help immediately. or Someone might would make some contacts on on these, but uh, one is the Christina lady that's coming, Winley, and another family that was here this morning we had prayer with, the Lanes. But uh, I'd like you to remember these things. I'd like you to pray about them. I need you to come to me. I've had a few. I need you to come. Brother Woods, tell me what you have an interest in, and we'll talk, and we'll see. But as soon as possible, at least on the knocking on doors, I'm going to try to keep this before you with the help and grace of God. Uh, I want to get started. I want to do it year-round. I'm praying about it. I want you to pray about it. We've already made some headway over here in River Creek. We, we talked about maybe just going back in there for, you know, three or four months. We may not set a time, but we'll say we'll do it until we feel like we've adequately covered it. Until we've knocked on every door several times. or You know, and we're, we're not going to be knocking on every... We'll knock on every door up front, but when we go to a house and they spit in our face and say, don't darken my door again, we'll shake the dust off our feet and go on. We'll mark that. We'll do a Brother Lambda. We'll mark that down. Don't go back here. That's one less door in that neighborhood to knock on. But when we say, we get an open invitation, someone says, I, I, I come to church. And they, they seem open to us. But the next Sunday they're not in church. We'll knock on that one again. We'll hit that one again. So we have to work on kind of putting a system together. Some sheets put together. And take keeping track of some things. I'm not interested in barging into it. I want to go into it with some sense. I want to go into it knowing what we're doing. I didn't mention all of these things to tell you everybody's got to do everything. I'm just telling you that everybody needs to do something. And you need to find your place, okay? Pray about it. I can do this, Brother Woods. I can help here. You know what? Even if we had some young men, maybe some of these young men, after Sunday afternoon service, there are cups left on the picnic table. There may be a basketball left out somewhere. In other words, I'll be responsible for after Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning after lunch. I will go around and before Sunday afternoon service starts, I'll make sure that all trash is picked up in the trash can and all the balls are put away. What's wrong with that? Hello? Is there anything wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that, is it? Look, there are places you can serve. You may even see needs that I don't see. Brother Woods, I've had it hard about this. This needs been on my heart. All right. So what are we doing? Praying, finding a place you can serve, letting that desire to serve be known, making yourself available as you can be. Okay? Anybody like to comment before we close?
Would anybody like to share something? I guess you figure Brother Wood shared enough of it, huh? All right. I can take a hint. Hallelujah. You folks are wonderful. I love you so much. Stand to your feet. You're good to me. I pray I'm half as good to y'all. Hallelujah. Remember Brother Lapp? He said he'd like to have some visits, all right? He might be in there the next two or three weeks. Don't forget about it. God lays it on your heart to bless him financially. You do that, all right? And let's just ask God to be with him and help him. And, and let's keep being here. Uh, I'll be leaving for Mexico Wednesday. I haven't called him and notified him yet, but Brother brother Ross, Donald Ross, they're supposed to be on their way tomorrow. And he'll be preaching Wednesday night. He don't know it yet, but... <laughs> Preaching Wednesday night. Next Sunday, Brother Cotto will be preaching. You're going to be here, Jackson, right? Next Sunday? Huh? All right. Brother Ross Jackson will be preaching Sunday afternoon. Brother Cotto will be preaching Sunday morning. Brother Ross will be preaching. Josh Jackson will be preaching Sunday afternoon. And we're going to ask Brother Donald Ross to preach our Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening services. We'll be back Thursday a week. Please pray for us. we got a very, very busy trip. And... Um, just remember us in prayer, and we'll see you, um, Lord willing, we'll see you two weeks. And Sunday, we'll be here ready to go and looking forward for what God's going to do. If Jesus doesn't come, if He comes, see in glory. Amen. Amen. If y'all will see me in glory. Amen. I'll see you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your mercy and your kindness to us. Thank you for your grace, O oh Lord. Thank you for, Lord, your power. Thank you for the gospel that saves us. The gospel of Christ. The gospel of God. The gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of our salvation. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you for this gospel, Lord, that is for all. Oh, the uncircumcision and for the circumcision. Thank you for the gospel, O oh Lord, that liberates men and makes them new creatures. Thank you for the men and women in this church. I want you to lay it on their heart. I want you to help us to find our place. I want you to help us to know our part in the body. And Lord, if some try something don't work out as much, they'll, Lord, they'll try another area. But put it in our hearts. Give us your heart for the lost. Show us how we can reach our neighborhood. Lord, let our resources become what you are in your hands to do the work. Our homes, your homes. Lord, our vehicles, your vehicles. Our, our money, your money. And do whatever you want to do. God, I praise you and I thank you. And I give you glory and praise for the day we've had, for your presence I've felt, the liberty in Christ Jesus. I'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.